Writer and director David Ayer's original cut of Suicide Squad was not only a very different movie, containing several scenes left on the cutting room floor, but also featured a darker, bleaker tone, while containing none of the pop songs shoehorned into the theatrical cut of the film in a shameless attempt to copy Guardians of the Galaxy. Hollywood, I tell people, is like watching someone you love get by someone you hate. So let's dive in and find out why the film was taken away from him and what could have been David Ayer's Suicide Squad. Following Man of Steel, DC greenlit a number of projects to build out their new cinematic universe to compete with Marvel's. And one of those projects was Suicide Squad, helmed by writer and director David Ayer, famous for writing Training Day and writing and directing Fury. And his approach to Suicide Squad was to do his own version of the Dirty Dozen, but with supervillains. And if your protagonists are all villains, that means your antagonist has to be an even more evil villain. Which is why Ayer's original script for Suicide Squad featured Steppenwolf arriving during the film's climax fight to reveal that he's been controlling Enchantress with a mother box as she opens a portal to Apocalypse to prep for Steppenwolf's invasion. In addition to this, the monsters that served as Enchantress's minions throughout the film were originally supposed to be parademons. However, once Zack Snyder decided to feature Steppenwolf as the primary antagonist in the Justice League, Air was forced to change his script and was only given six weeks to rewrite it as the film's release date was set in stone. Regardless, the shoot for Suicide Squad generally went pretty well. Apart from reports of Jared Leto's excessive method acting. Whenever I met Jared, he never broke character. He, he cut a chunk out of my eyebrow. Uh, as an actor, it was, it was fun to watch, and as a human being, it was scary. Leto's method acting also extended to sending various gifts to each of his castmates. He had a henchman who would come into the rehearsal room, and the henchman came in with a dead pig and plopped it on the table. And there was a live rat in the box. She screamed, and then she kept it. <laughs> Don't forget the uh, anal beads. Who did you send anal beads to? The used condoms. Apart from the used condoms, which is abhorrent, this behavior might have been more tolerated and even somewhat acceptable had Leto turned in an Oscar-worthy performance on par with Heath Ledger before him or Joaquin Phoenix after him. Unfortunately, he didn't, resulting in his antics not only coming off as pretentious, but annoying to some of his castmates. So if there's a lesson to be learned here, it's this. Jared, he went, he went full Joker, you know? And the rule generally is never go full Joker. Shortly after filming wrapped, Ayer and the cast arrived at Comic-Con where they showed a sneak preview of the film to the audience that was dark, gritty, and somber with haunting operatic music playing over top. When this footage leaked onto the internet, Warner Brothers reluctantly decided to release a high resolution version of it for all to see. Ironically, this footage may be the closest glimpse we'll ever have of the tone Ayer envisioned for the film because when the first trailer publicly dropped several months later, it had a decidedly different tone. It was fun, upbeat, and it had Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody thumping throughout. However, this was just a trailer, and trailers have been known to be tonally different from their movies before, since the goal is just to get people into the theater. Unfortunately, this trailer would be a sign of things to come. The much-hyped Batman v Superman would come out next, and not only get hammered by critics, but underperform at the box office relative to Warner Brothers' expectations. BVS was criticized for being too dark, drab, and somber. Warner Brothers Brothers, realizing Suicide Squad was tonally similar, began to panic, as they didn't want it to suffer the same fate as BVS. While David Ayer worked with Lee Smith, Christopher Nolan's editor, to finish cutting the picture, Warner Brothers decided to hire the company that cut the trailer, the aptly named Trailer Park Inc., to re-edit the movie in the same style. And they're the ones responsible for editing all of the jazzy graphics and littering the film with pop songs in an effort to replicate the tone of Guardians of the Galaxy, which had come out a couple years earlier and was famous for its soundtrack featuring classic songs from the 60s and 70s. From here, the studio decided to do what's called a bake-off, where they screen test both versions of the film with an audience to see which one is liked more. Basically, they let the audience decide, and typically, there's a clear winner. With Suicide Squad, however, both versions tested exactly the same, with audiences liking and disliking different parts of each version of the film. Regardless, since they tested the same, you would think the sensible thing to do would be to let the artist and the person responsible for creating creating this film, David Ayer, release his version of it. Instead, the studio, in their infinite wisdom, decided to make a Frankenstein monster, combining the best moments of both versions, while ordering reshoots to turn it from a soulful drama into a lighthearted comedy, following Deadpool's success at the box office. We're gonna turn David Ayer's dark, soulful movie into a comedy now. <laughs> that shit broke me. 
And while the end result would be a box office success, critically, the movie received largely negative reviews, with many fans feeling misled by the film's marketing, which heavily featured the Joker, even though he only briefly appeared in the film. Oh, there were so many scenes that got cut from the movie, I, I couldn't even start. Upon realizing that numerous shots from the trailer were absent in the final film, and hearing Leto, and even Ayer himself, express their dissatisfaction with the extensive recutting of the picture, fans started speculating about the extent of differences in Ayer's version of the film. To start, Ayer's version would have opened with an extended sequence featuring archaeologist June Moon discovering Enchantress, which would have led into the credits. However, in the version we got, not only was June's introduction shortened and lumped in with the rest of the squad, which is no way to introduce your villain, but her arc and character in the final film was also stripped away, making her a pretty underwhelming villain. We also would have seen more of the relationship between June and Rick Flagg, which would have added a lot more weight to the climax of the film when Flagg is faced with having to potentially kill the woman he loves. Not only that, but based on concept art released by Ayer, he originally wanted to depict a much more haunting and ethereal take on Enchantress, with her surrounded by an array of eyes versus the dark and drab version we got. The toxic dynamic of Joker and Harley's relationship was also heavily changed after it tested poorly with audiences. In Ayer's original version, Joker would have been much more abusive, controlling, and jealous of not only the new friends Harley would have made on her mission, but her budding relationship with Deadshot as well, who she would have bonded with and developed feelings for, ultimately resulting in the pair hooking up. A leftover from this cut storyline is Harley asking Deadshot if she has a hickey. What, I got a hickey or something? and her budding relationship with Deadshot, who would have treated her with respect, would have tied into her abusive Stockholm Syndrome-like relationship with Joker, who in the air cut throws her out of the helicopter after telling her he wants to see other people. Hey man. The shit that I do for you. We're gonna talk. In the theatrical cut, this is the last we see of Joker until the end of the movie, where he breaks Harley out of prison. However, in Ayer's cut, following the helicopter crash, Enchantress would have appeared and struck a deal with Joker, which is where these photos of Joker with a burnt face originate from. In exchange for helping her, Enchantress would agree to make Joker King of Gotham and give him Harley. The climax of the film would have seen Joker return, armed with Waller's detonator, before ordering Harley to get Katana's soul-possessing sword for Enchantress, refusing to betray her friends and seeing Joker for the user and abuser he is, Harley would have finally stood up to him and swiped the detonator from him. The squad would have then turned on Joker, leading him to escape. After defeating Enchantress, Harley and Deadshot would have shared a kiss, solidifying their blossoming romance and demonstrating Harley's growth as a character as she's finally able to recognize that she was in an abusive relationship. Instead, the theatrical cut had Harley and Joker in a Bonnie and Clyde style romance, devoid of Harley's relentless struggle to break free from his toxic influence over her, reducing Harley to nothing more than a Joker groupie and fangirl as she delights at his eventual return at the end of the film to break her out of prison. By contrast, in Ayer's version, the end of the film would have seen Joker breaking into prison and holding a gun to Harley's head before cutting to black. El Diablo also wouldn't have died sacrificing himself to defeat Incubus. Instead, the team would have taken turns attacking Incubus, leading up to Katana finally slicing his head off, absorbing his spirit into the Soul Taker. Speaking of Katana, there's a shot of her in the trailer where her eyes turn black that's not in the theatrical cut in the film. In fact, this shot would have also taken place during the climax of the film, and it would have seen Enchantress take control of Katana using one of her tendrils, forcing her to attack the rest of the squad. Another example of the theatrical cut neutering the Joker involved Monster T's death. In Ayer's version, Joker would have actually manipulated Monster T into shooting himself, taking his own life, which would have showcased what a methodical and terrifying psychopath the Joker is. Instead, we ended up with a version of this scene that just has Joker shooting Monster T out of jealousy for ogling Harley. Unlike the rest of the squad in the theatrical cut, Slipknot never gets an introduction explaining his backstory or how he came to be imprisoned. Instead, he just shows up as part of the team before being swiftly killed off early in the mission. However, Ayer actually shot Slipknot's backstory, but it was cut out of the film to reduce the film's runtime. Speaking of character introductions, when Harley's introduced, we learn via this 
text that she was an accomplice to the murder of Robin. And while this is never elaborated on in the film, Ayer has gone on record explaining the backstory, saying Joker killed Robin and Batman smashed his teeth out and locked him up in Arkham. That's where the grill comes from. And it's an Arkham where Joker would have given himself the damage tattoo as a message to Batman saying, you've damaged me. I was so beautiful before and now you've destroyed my face. However, Harley being an accomplice makes absolutely no sense since we see Joker with his grill with Dr. Quinzel before she turns into Harley, which goes against Ayer's timeline of events. Allegedly, this line of text was added in by Jeff Johns, one of the producers on the film. You can't help but feel bad for Ayer seeing all these different cooks in the kitchen pulling his film in so many different directions. Unfortunately, Zack Snyder would go through a similar experience on Justice League, with the studio taking the film away from him before reshooting and recutting it. However, thanks to the release the Snyder Cut movement, we would eventually get to see Snyder's original vision for the film. A huge thank you to all of the fans that made this possible. And due to the success of that movement, calls have begun to release the air cut of Suicide Squad. In March 2021, when asked if we would see the air cut, then chairman and CEO of Warner Brothers, Ann Sarnoff, said no. However, this story does have a promising ending. Since James Gunn took over DC Studios, he allegedly told Ayer that his cut of the film would have its time to be shared. And while I wouldn't expect to see it anytime soon, it seems like we'll all get to see it eventually. Thanks for watching, everybody, and don't forget to like and subscribe to Bullets and Blockbusters for more great content.